If it ain't got those hands, man, it don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that stretch, if it ain't got those eyes, and it don't mean a thing. If it isn't a ticket, and it don't mean a thing. If it don't mean a thing. That is a voice and sound of our times, a member of the so-called beat generation dramatically expressing a negative attitude toward the 20th century. His haven, away from the rest of the world, is a coffee house in downtown New York, in an area known as Greenwich Village, perhaps the most unusual and colorful village in the world. The village is made up of uh, a lot of people. Uh, they are both uh, pundits and uh, something less than humans. And that is the voice of an artist who has painted in a village studio for 40 years. Many works of art and literature have been inspired in this locale of some two square Manhattan miles. Theodore Dreiser, St. Clair Lewis, Sherwood Anderson, and Eugene O'Neill spent their early creative years along its winding, narrow streets. Today, each of its 130,000 residents has a different reason for living there and a varying notion as to just what the village is. To the editor of a village paper, it is something much different. You have all levels of society down here. You have all cultural levels down here. You have a community life. You have a political life, which is extremely alive. And you have, most of all, a uh, cultural life, which is unlike any other part of the United States. A psychologist has much the same impression. The village has a deeper significance, uh, culturally and intellectually, to the whole country. It's a kind of intellectual crossroads here. Not only are ideas spawned here that, that go out throughout the country, but people are constantly coming and going. There are certain bars in the village, for instance, that if you want to know what's going on in Paris, you, uh, you can go down and find out what some friend of yours is doing uh, in Paris or San Francisco or Taos or wherever it happens to be. Because it is a kind of nerve center for uh, certain intellectual and artistic trends. To a local minister faced with the problem of tending to the spiritual needs of the villagers, it is this. One of the definitions of Greenwich Village is that it is a community of revolt, or in revolt, uh, against uh, much of uh, middle-class American values and standards and ways of life. The rebellious spirit has produced some angry young men, some rebels with and without a cause. On a Sunday, sunny afternoon, they and others gather in Washington Square Park. Their frustration, their anger, or just plain energy are released in different ways. On a park bench, two boys bang out rhythm on bongo drums. Sometimes it is said that many of the so-called beats in the village take marijuana. A possible explanation for this is linked to the mushroom clouds that hover over all of humanity. We know the biggest age bomb pushers in the world, man. Those are Khrushchev and Ike. These are two ball-headed son of a <clears throat> pardon the expression. They're on either side of the world. Now these son of a guns don't want to get one individual high. They want to blow all of us out of here. These are the biggest age bomb button pushers I know of, man. Now that's a groove, you know? I mean, they talk about marijuana and stuff like that. When in other countries, it's taken more as a sickness. And here, I mean, you're shoved into jail, and that's it. I mean, like, these cats are, are, are bickering back and forth, and sooner or later, they're going to blow us all out of here, man. And I mean, it's senseless. How many beats or members of the beat generation are there in the village, and who are they? This is not clearly defined. There is a lot of confusion about it, even though they have become the village's most recent attraction. Some simply say, I'm just a member of this generation, that's all. It's difficult, actually, to find anyone who will deliberately label himself as being beat. This is true even in the coffee houses, which are supposed to be the beatniks' headquarters. One floor beneath ground level of an ancient brownstone on lively McDougall Street, crossroads of the village, there is time for a brief conversation with some poets who read nightly at the Gaslight Cafe. Despite the fact that the readings have been advertised as being by poets of the Beat Generation, there is no clear picture, even here, of what this means. As, as, as far as Beat Generation goes, to me, I am myself now writing at this period in this time, if the tag Beat Generation is given to the area in which I write, or the time in which I write, you know, I can't do anything about it. I am not beat, I'm not finished, I'm not done. I want to write, I'm going to write, and if I don't change my, you know, style, and if I don't get any polish and discipline, if I don't do anything, then there's no reason in writing. Only the dead are beat. Basically, I think it means fed up to the extent where one strips off the uh, falsities 
put upon oneself by what we call society or general culture or whatever be to the extent where these things just disappear and one is reduced to a state of almost elemental being, somewhat similar to a, the uh, prime example of existentialist living, I suppose. I don't really know. Every, every group of people is eventually accused by the press and the public of being a bunch of depraved maniacs who spend, you know, 24 hours of a day in a drug coma. And, uh, but I'm, you know, I agree with Dan there, man. There's thousands of things to do, and I'm gonna do them. And uh, there are lots of things to see, and I'm gonna see them, and there are lots of kicks, and I'm gonna be kicked by them. And, uh, you know, that's it. Since these young poets are not paid for this new village entertainment, the question is, how do they stay alive? I, will, I work behind the counter. I made sandwiches and, and espresso and all that. I have this one thing here published, The Fable of the Final Hour. There are some being sold. I make money. I have some money owed to me from when I was working and loaning money to people. Get money here and there. It doesn't take much to live. There is a hush in the crowd. Only the gasp and the gurgle of the espresso machine is heard as this cellar religious meeting is called to order by a bearded leader in his late teens. We'll start tonight's reading off. There are two poets to each set. This set at the Gaslight tonight. It's going to be John Brent and Dan Proper. John Brent is going to start it off. Thank you. The first poem I'm going to read is dedicated to my fellow sufferers. Telephone wrapped around my ear, screamed at me, tried to suck out of my mind where I was, was stuck to my head and jabbered till I said, the person you have reached is not a working person. He has been changed and is temporarily connected. Please hang yourself up. All of the poems seem to have an anger, an anguish, a despair, a desolation. You ended up ash in a spoon, you ended up flesh wrapped in fog. The payment for a ride and a journey, your end. The silk hands that warmed you, caressed you strengthless. And the desire became a need, and the need became a hunger, and the hunger a torment, and the torment total pain. You ended up a pinch of white powder. You ended up soot on a spoon handle. You ended up a taste of milk sugar. You ended up a hole in the arm that needed a funnel, a clock that watched the days for pain. You ended up ash in a spoon, your soul in a brown paper bag. Then there is a reading by a jazz musician turned poet. As he reads, he taps his foot as if he were accompanying himself on a sad saxophone. Swinging inward toward a fiery furnace, gates of hell into dungeons of the mind and insanity, Corridors lined with hollow-eyed skeletons who walk with slow dragon steps. Lost souls lined up answering the bells, the eternal ringing of the bells. Mountains stand tall in the night and bird song is sung from lips caked with hate. Sing your song, little cardinal. Wear your bluesy chants into the wind, into the rain, into the cold black bars of your prison cell. In California, sweet girls brush tears from their eyes and Indian Joe dance to the white man's game. Rock bottom blues slip from moaning saxophones and slip through cracks of the pavement. Cigarette butts refuse to be out and red lips drink wisdom from the sea. Aware of beauty, soul soared high. Gates of hell proclaiming the birth of a man who was only one year old. Every year we die a little and the world keeps on spinning. Redbird, are you listening? Are you there? A ghost who walks on feet of stone from the concrete floor. Paradise opened her arms and received life's blue sweet song. Cold steel crying in the night wind, and the beauty is there. Reach out and touch it, give it your lips. Gates of hell where night is a terror filled with the longing for hot, thirsty thighs. Great Janae, great genius, knows the meaning of life, while Joe Goo over in Never Never Land walks with button down shirts. Brooks Brothers, Marx Brothers, my brothers, when will you cry life's sweet song? The publisher of the local paper, The Village Voice, is Edwin Fancher who is also a psychologist. He has a similar theory about the village's most controversial residents. Well, I, I see the beatniks really as the latest chapter in a long tradition of 
bohemian protest. Uh, some of the old bohemians that I've talked to, uh, going back to the 20s and so on, uh, feel that they are very much in that tradition. Uh, it's a tradition of revolt, it's a tradition of shock. It obviously can't be the same kind of revolt against uh, sexual mores and so on that you had in uh, the 1920s. It can't be the same kind of political, uh, political protest that you had in the 1930s. Uh, perhaps our dilemma today is more profound in that there aren't such simple uh, enemies that one can be in revolt against anymore. Perhaps that is why the Beat Generation seems to have less form and directness and why it seems to be more mystical. But I think what is significant is the interest that the American people have shown in this very, very small little group of, of uh, artists. An artist who has spent his lifetime in the village, D. Hirsch Margulies, a sort of paunchy painter, in the Sixth Avenue studio expresses an historical point of view about the young newcomers. There are always beatniks in the village, and the beatniks are people, usually, uh, who uh, are people of a dreamy frame of mind in search of adventure. There are many reasons why people come to the village to live or just visit, and perhaps it's best expressed by a young Negro boy. I come down here because I find people I have something in common with. And um, we're working for you know, a good cause. And I, I, we have something in common, and I, that's the sort of people I can associate with. What is that? You say you have something in common. We believe in the same things. Which like, is what? What do you believe in? We believe like... Live and let live. Live and let live. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go along with that. And um, you know, like you can be happy without being a millionaire. Do you live in the village yourself? No, but I'm moving here in a couple of weeks. Why are you coming down? Because, like, I feel like I belong here. You feel like you belong here? Yes. What is it that would make you feel that? The, the general feeling among the people. Like brotherhood, and among the Brotherhood, I'll go along with that word. Brotherhood, that's yes.